uh, a very renowned uh, Ghanaian of obstetrician. I'm sure you all know him or at least heard of him before. He's Dr. Muniz Warren. He's currently a fetal maternal maternal and fetal medicine specialist in uh, Hospital Tunku Azizaya. And uh, he's going to be joining us today. He's going to talk to us about cancers in pregnancy. I think uh, he will be asking some questions. So please volunteer and answer the questions when he asks them to you. All right, I pass the, the stage to Dr. Muniz. <laughs> okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's indeed a privilege to meet all of y'all here today. I was expecting to meet all of y'all on site, but it's going to be virtual. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I've been given the task to speak on cancers in pregnancy. So first and foremost, I've got no disclosure of interest in this talk. But having said that, I am a maternal medicine specialist. I'm not a fetal maternal specialist, so my passion remains medical disorders in pregnancy, and hence I do have vested interest with regards to managing patients with cancer in pregnancy. So I'm going to start my talk with a brief overview. In the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about some brief introduction, some questions. I do hope uh, you can answer these questions at home. Some principles of care, some principles in management, a quick brief on specific malignancies, and then some take-home messages. So cancer in pregnancy, is it common? The incidence is one in thousand pregnancies. If you work in a busy hospital in Malaysia, you can expect to see at least about 10 women coming to your hospital every year. Now, it is more common than perceived. Cancer is not on the rise, but I believe we now are better in diagnosing and managing patients with cancer. If you read the most recent Embrace report, the mortality from cancers in pregnancy is as high as 1 in 100,000. The Malaysian report does include cancers in pregnancy, and believe me, the mortality in Malaysia is higher than 1 in 100,000. Sadly, based on the Embrace report, 1 in 5, they believe, could have had better care. So yes, is this topic important? Extremely important. So I've got two roles today. One is to prepare y'all for exams, namely MRCOG, but more importantly is to make y'all better specialists so that you are well versed and more comfortable in managing patients with cancer in pregnancy. So my five golden rules in managing cancer in pregnancy. So these are my five rules. Please do not state them in your own examinations. Rule number one. If you have a mother who presents with non-specific symptoms, example, chronic back pain, weakness of the limbs, paresthesia, headache, please never just say it is normal in pregnancy. Never blame the pregnancy. Any concern, any complaints should be appropriately established, should be reviewed and managed. Golden principle number two. No investigation you can't do in pregnancy. Can you do a CT scan? Yes, you can. Can you do a biopsy? Yes, you can. Can you do an MRI? Yes, you can. Can you do an X-ray? Yes, you can. So please do not use pregnancy as an excuse. Almost every imaging is not contraindicated in pregnancy. Rule number three. It's a sin not to treat cancer in pregnancy. So please do not say a mother has got cancer. Please do not say you have to terminate the pregnancy. The answer is not correct. Most cancers can be treated in pregnancy. I'll be outlining the management in the next few minutes. Termination or delivery is not always the answer. For example, if you've got a pregnant mother who's got breast cancer at 30 weeks of pregnancy, you do not, nearly, you do not actually have to deliver her you can still manage the cancer and deliver head term. So please remember as obstetricians, do not always deliver all patients with cancer prematurely. Do not always terminate the pregnancy. You can manage these cancers effectively in pregnancy. What is important is a multidisciplinary team and the team should be of updated team of experts. 
So what I usually do, I'm a medical medicine specialist in my whole hospital. I usually are involved personally in the care of such patients. What is important is two important things. You need a holistic care and the care should be a shared decision with the patient and also the patient's partner. So not just a multidisciplinary care, but a multidisciplinary care of the relevant experts. So here's an embrace report. What does the recent embrace report say about malignancies in pregnancy? So what is a red flag? Any patient who presents with pain, my stress test is opioids. If the pain resolves by paracetamol, do not worry. But if she's got abdominal pain that she requires opioids, she's got headache that, opioid, that requires opioids, that is significant that warrants additional investigation. So for me, if a mother presents with headache, not resolved with PCM, only opioids, she needs an imaging of the brain. The second important key fact, thrombosis is common because pregnancy is hypercoagulable. But thrombosis in an unusual location, for example, thrombosis in the upper arm, thrombosis in the capillaries, these are unusual sites please look for an underlying malignancy. Don't just treat her and send her away. If a pregnant mother presents with headache, please do not forget your fundoscopy. You need to exclude a pathology in the brain. Now, one important aspect of a pregnant woman is the postpartum period. The postpartum period is when a pregnant woman does not have good care. Antenatally, she'll be able to see a specialist, Postpartum, unfortunately, she only sees the midwife or the junior doctor. So any woman who presents in the postpartum period, please ensure that a specialist reviews her. It can also be a common presentation of a sinister disease. Signs and symptoms such as tachypnea, chest pain, tachycardia, or topnia, please don't blame the pregnancy. Please investigate and review her holistically. If you have a diagnosis of cancer in pregnancy, the investigation, the management, the intervention is the same as a non-pregnant woman. Please don't just say TCA six weeks post-delivery. That is not correct. The time scale of intervention should be within two weeks. A woman with cancer, of course, contraception should be individualized. And of course, you need to look for familial syndromes in any woman who presents with cancer, namely BRCA1 and BRCA2. So here's a question. A 42-year-old lady has a routine mammogram and was later found that she was 12 weeks pregnant. So question number one to you all, what is the radiation dose from a two-view mammogram? So when you talk about obstetric medicine, two important areas that you must actually be an expert in. Number one is imaging in pregnancy and number two is medications in pregnancy. So you must know this recent paper, which is published in the TOG, it came out in March last year about imaging in pregnancy. So the principles is, if the radiation is below 50 milligrays, irrespective of the gestation, there are no adverse fetal outcomes. So what is the radiation from a mammogram? It varies between 0 0.01 to 0 0.01. So ladies and gentlemen, a mammogram is safe in pregnancy. It is not usually the standard of care. Normally we will do an ultrasound, but if it happens to have a mammogram in pregnancy, it is okay. So here is my important favorite table Please use this table in your daily consultation clinics. I suggest you keep this table in your clinics and your ward rounds. It makes your counseling extremely easy and important. So please read this March 2019 paper on TOG in pregnancy. Tumor markers. Is there a role for tumor markers in pregnancy? The answer is no. Please do not do tumor markers in pregnancy. Your CA125 is raised, your CEA is raised, your alpha fetoprotein is raised. There are no role for tumor markers in pregnancy. Having said that, for all of you all who are going for the gold medal in your exams, which tumor markers are unchanged in pregnancy? The answer is three. Inhibin, AMH, and LDH. You can do these tumor markers. These markers are unchanged in pregnancy. 
Yeah, various, various papers talking about the role of LDH as a tumor marker. And of course, AMH is increased in granulosa cell tumors. So you can, but it is not the standard of care. But if you really need one, these three markers are okay. So what are the principles of management? If you can't really remember the entire 45 minutes of my talk, please remember this slide and the following slide. First and foremost, please stage the cancer. Is it early stage? Is it advanced stage? Number two, ask yourself one question. Does pregnancy make it worse? Rarely, a very few conditions, pregnancy makes it worse, namely estrogen secreting tumors, such as meningioma or breast cancer. Question number three, what is the effect of the cancer on the fetus? Most likely it is prematurity. The most important question as an obstetrician, can you treat this pregnancy? Can you treat this cancer in pregnancy? If you can, then yes, do treat it. What are the other balance of care? What is the gestation of diagnosis? Early disease at any time of the pregnancy, please treat the pregnancy as per norm. Late advanced disease later in the pregnancy is early delivery. Advanced disease early in the pregnancy usually is termination of pregnancy. Remember I told you all about shared care. It is always important to include the couple's perception about the pregnancy, about a disease, and also about the fetus. So what are the management principles in pregnancy? Here are my 10 step management principles about cancer in pregnancy. Step number one, certain cancers are slow growing. Example, papillary thyroid CA, pre-invasive cervical lesions. You can actually manage them with surveillance in pregnancy. You do not really have to deliver them prematurely. You do not really need to treat the cancer per se. It is expectant management. So there is a role for expectant management of cancers in pregnancy. Surgical excision. If you can do a cesarean section in pregnancy, it means you can do any other surgeries in pregnancy. Mastectomies, radical mastectomies, cystectomies, excision of tumors can be done. Usually surgeries are done after 14 weeks of pregnancy. So the first and second trimesters are an important aspect to perform surgeries. What is important intraoperatively is the preoperative maternal and fetal monitoring. Some people advocate left lateral positions. Most of the medications, anesthetic medications are safe. It does not cause fetal anomalies. The mother is in a late second trimester. You can give steroids. You can tocolize the pregnancy. If you're going for a gold medal, you can include certain pearls in your answers. Example, monitoring of entitled CO2 monitoring, avoidance of maternal hypotension, and avoidance of maternal hypo and hypercapnia. Can you do laparoscopy in pregnancy? Yes. There are no randomized controlled trials. But what is recommended is an open technique with lower CO2 in separation pressures. So all of you all who are going for exams, I'm sure you can aware that operating pressure should be below 15 millimeters mercury. If you were to operate on a pregnant mother, the recommended pressures is between 12 to 15. But what is important is monitoring of N-tidal CO2 intraoperatively. So surgery is safe. What about radiation in pregnancy? It is usually avoided. Remember the magic number of 50 milligrays in pregnancy that causes toxicity to the fetus? Most of the radiation, the average exposure is 300 milligrays. So although radiation is okay, it is not usually recommended unless it is important to save the mother's life. Example, in a spinal cord compression, in a mother who is pregnant. In those instances, we think the benefit of radiation is important that you can radiate the mother, but it is not usually done as a routine. Chemotherapy. Most chemotherapies are safe in pregnancy, especially after 12 weeks, once embryogenesis has been completed. And various other medications, example, dexamethasone, chytril, ondansetron, are all safe antiemetic agents in pregnancy. What about terminations in pregnancy? There is a role. 
especially if you think pregnancy makes it worse, especially if the mother has got an advanced disease early in the pregnancy. Please do not forget thromboprophylaxis. The presence of an active disease in pregnancy increases the risk of VTE. So all mothers with an active cancer in pregnancy is an, is an important score for thromboprophylaxis. Growth scans are important. There's an increased risk of IUGRs in patients who have got cancer. So they do need growth scans. Now what causes IUGR? Is it the chemotherapy or is it the treatment? It is actually the maternal condition of having a malignancy per se. So the principle of care, make the mother as healthy as early as possible and you can actually reduce the incidence of IUGR. In certain conditions, you do need to send the placental for HPE. For example, if the mother has got a melanoma or if the mother has got a breast cancer, sometimes sending the placental for HPE is one important aspect of risk stratification of tumors. Mental health. I'm sure all of you all can and are aware of the importance of mental health in pregnancy, especially if you've got a significant disease especially if you've got the big C in pregnancy. So yes, do screen and assess for mental health. MDT. Just by saying MDT alone is not enough, who should be involved in an MDT should ideally be an obstetrician with a special interest, the medical medicine specialist, the oncologist, the radiologist, the surgeons should be involved. There should be a shared decision making. And finally, you should have a documented care plan. And these are my 10 essential steps on principles of management of cancer in pregnancy. So question number two, a 32 year old lawyer undergoes laparoscopic right cystectomy at 14 weeks of pregnancy for a unilateral ovarian tumor. My question to you, she's rhesus negative and her partner is rhesus positive. So trainees, do you think she needs NTD prophylaxis? if you were to do a cystectomy for a unilateral ovarian tumor? So you can answer yourself. If you answer yes, she needs rhesus isoimmunization and thromboprophylaxis, you are wrong. The correct answer is she does not need NTD prophylaxis because cystectomy is not a desensitizing event. So not all patients need NTD prophylaxis if you were to do surgeries. Only those that has got a risk of metal fetal hemorrhages. Question number three, does chemotherapy cause a UGR? That was what was previously taught, but now we do know that chemotherapy does not cause a UGR. What causes a UGR is the mother's nutritional status, the mother's underlying medical condition, which is the cancer. And so the principle of care is treat her cancer as aggressive and as effectively as possible, and that will improve pregnancy outcomes. Question number four. A 27-year-old cancer survivor books a pregnancy at 12 weeks. She is in remission of a cancer, but gives a history of having antracycline chemotherapy for six weeks. Now, the key word is antracycline chemotherapy. So for all of y'all who's going for the gold medal in the MRCOG exams, what investigations would you perform? So the correct answer is an ECG and a fit and an echo. Why is that so? Those who have got exposure to anthracycline chemotherapy has got a risk of having cardiomyopathies. It is actually dose dependent. So the correct answer that I'm looking for is a maternal ECG and echo to look for cardiomyopathy. If you got that right, well done. If you got that wrong, it's time to revisit the guidelines on cancer in pregnancy. So I'm going to move on to my talk. Having had spoken on principles of care, I'm going to now talk on specific cancers, namely breast, ovarian, cervix, thyroid, hematological, and other conditions. But I'm going to spend majority of my time to talk about breast cancer in pregnancy, which I think is extremely important. As far as you could remember, I don't think so. There's been a question on breast cancer in pregnancy. The guidelines has changed once. 
And I believe it has never been asked. So it is important. It's important to know, especially management of breast cancer in pregnancy. Okay, breast cancer in pregnancy. The incidence is one in 3,000. It is the most common cancer in pregnancy. Fortunately, 80% of breast lumps are benign. But please do remember, 3% of the time, you may diagnose a cancer in pregnancy for the very first time. Now, what are the challenges in pregnancy? We have got really limited prospective research data. Sadly, evidence are mainly from case reports and retrospective data. Now, here's an important paper called the Norwegian study. Does pregnancy increase your chance of breast cancer? The answer is no. But there's a peak incidence of cancers three to four years after delivery. Why is that so? I believe it depends on the woman's reproductive age group. Majority of them will embark in the pregnancy earlier on in their reproductive age. Hence, there is a peak three to four years after delivery. What is important in terms of history? Up to 48% of young mothers have got no significant family history. One in 10 will have a significant family history. So it's important to ask family history of cancers, namely BRCA1 and BRCA2. Always ask for history of breast lumps in pregnancy. Do you need to routinely examine the breast of every single pregnant mother? Well, let's take a look at various recommendations. If you are sitting for the UK exams, the NICE 2016 guidelines in pregnancy do not recommend routine examination of the breast in pregnancy. The ACOG guidelines does recommend if the mother's age is above 40. The Canadian guidelines recommends routine examination in pregnancy. But the Malaysian guideline for once is far more aggressive than the NICE guidelines and recommends examination in pregnancy. So the current consensus is controversial. Some say yes, some say no. But my current advice is to routinely examine every mother's breast during booking in pregnancy, although it is not the NICE recommendations in pregnancy. So do we need to investigate all breast lumps in pregnancy? Or can you just give her an outpatient appointment six weeks after delivery? So the answer is yes, you do need to examine every single breast lump in pregnancy, especially if it's persistent for a period of beyond two weeks. It is a common sin to say that it is the breast abscess, to say it is mastitis, and just to send her off but please remember, any pregnant mother who presents with a breast lump, you need to address it. You need to investigate it. So what are the, investment, what are the assessments of a breast lump in pregnancy? Three things. It's called the triple test. Palpate. Palpation alone is not enough. Ultrasound. Usually, you do not do a mammogram in pregnancy, although the radiation dose is insignificant. But the recommendation is ultrasound, especially if the woman is below the age of 30. You need to biopsy. It is not fine needle aspiration, but it is core or existential biopsy. And this is one important point in your exams. The second important point, the pathologist has to know that this patient was pregnant and because it is quite tricky to read a pathological HPE findings of breast cancer in pregnancy. Should you stage a mother? Yes, ultrasound of the liver, chest x-ray, these are not contraindicated in pregnancy. You don't routinely do a CT scan or a PET scan. It will be a clinical staging for chest x-ray and ultrasound of the liver is important. Let's move on to a clinical vignette. This is a real case of a patient that we managed in our own hospital almost three years ago. The 38-year-old nurse delivered her first baby in 2017. She complained of breast lump since April 2018 which was later confirmed to be malignant. Incidentally, her UPT was positive and she was eight weeks pregnant. She actually saw an obstetrician who counseled her for termination of pregnancy. So do you need to terminate every single patient with breast cancer early on in the pregnancy? Does termination alter the prognosis? The answer is no. The prognosis for each and every stage of the disease is equivalent to their non-pregnant counterparts. 
So termination of all breast cancers is not the correct answer. Is there a role for termination of pregnancy? It does not change maternal outcomes. Do not delay an intervention just because the mother is pregnant. What is important is you have a dedicated multidisciplinary team. You have an informed decision. So what did we do? We actually had a multidisciplinary meeting. We waited for five weeks. We started on chemotherapy after 14 weeks. We did a mastectomy midway in the pregnancy. We delivered her normally at term, and she and her baby are both well now. So what is the principles of management of breast cancer in pregnancy? Local control is the most important thing. Assessing maternal and fetal well-being, prevent metastasis. The treatment should be as close as possible to a non-pregnant woman with the same time frame which is initiate treatment within two to four weeks from diagnosis. Most important is an expert of multidisciplinary teams. For those of you all who have not seen this chart, this is a beautiful paper from the TOG, which was published in 2010. It beautifully summarizes the management of breast cancer in pregnancy. So just to summarize, any mother who presents with late stage of the disease, later in the pregnancy, is delivery. Any mother who presents with a late stage, second trimester, it is chemotherapy plus surgery. Late stage of the disease, early in the pregnancy, talk about termination of pregnancy. If a mother presents with early stage of the disease, you can actually treat and manage this cancer in the pregnancy. Please do not, number one, terminate the pregnancy. Please do not, number two, iatrogenically deliver her prematurely. Is chemotherapy in safe? These chemotherapies are safe. Cyclophosphamide are safe. Fluorouracils are safe. MTX is not usually recommended early in the first trimester of pre-pregnancy. Doxorubicin, abirubicin is safe. Idarubicin, trastuzumabs are safe. It is not associated with any adverse fetal outcomes. What is the effect of chemotherapy in pregnancy? All the studies showed a risk of stillbirth, growth restriction, and prematurity. But as time progresses, we now know that chemotherapy is safe. The risk of fetal outcomes is actually associated with maternal well-being. Chemotherapy, for one, does not cause fetal malformations. If a mother is not immunosuppressive, screen for infections, Please treat the infections, namely asymptomatic bacteria, because please remember she is on immunosuppressive medications. Vaccinations are safe. The mother is on chemotherapy. Vaccinations are not contraindicated. What doses do you use? Use the mother's booking weight, although it is controversial because the mother usually gains weight in pregnancy. What is the optimal timing of chemotherapy? After embryogenesis, most of the time, it is after 14 weeks. But usually, we stop at 34 weeks because you need a three-week interval before delivery because you do not want to deliver a fetus which is immunocompromised because the baby may have a higher chance of infections. Other medications, steroids, ondansetron, chytril, 5-HT3 serotonin antagonists are safe. Your granulocyte colony stimulating factors are also not contraindicated in pregnancy. Long-term risk of chemo exposure. What do we know? There are no increased risk of adverse childhood cancers. There are no adverse increased risk of neurocognitive deficits. There are no increased adverse risk of fetal cardiac dysfunctions. So pregnancy and chemotherapy is safe. Pregnancy should not be a contraindication for chemotherapy. That is what we already know now. Intrapartum care, it is recommended to stop the chemotherapy latest by 34 weeks because you need a three-week chemotherapy-free interval. Aim delivery at 37 weeks. Vaginal delivery is not contraindicated. There are very, very few contraindications for a vaginal delivery for a mother with cancer in pregnancy. And please do not forget to examine the placenta for metastasis. This is our own data from where I work in HKL. Over the last four years, we've almost had about 50 mothers with cancers in pregnancy. 
I'm talking about breast cancers per se, 64% of them had new adjuvant chemotherapies, 25% of them had radical mastectomies, 11% of them were followed up with surveillance. Based on our own data, 80% of our mothers delivered at term. The risk of miscarriages were not increased. They were the same as the normal population, which is about 15 to 20%. The incidence of termination of pregnancies in our own unit is low. It is roughly about 20%. The incidence of cesarean section is low. The incidence of stillbirth is low. The point that I'm trying to sell is with an effective multidisciplinary team of experts, you can actually normalize the care and manage cancers in pregnancy effectively well. Clinical weakness number two, a 38-year-old Nalip who has been subfertile for 10 years presents to the pre-pregnancy clinic expressing her desires to be pregnant. She had right breast cancer, she had a modified mastectomy, she had completed chemo radiation. Can she embark in the pregnancy? So the answer is yes. What is important, you should evaluate her in the pre-pregnancy clinic. You should know the initial stage of the disease. The general consensus is that she should be disease-free for at least 24 months because the risk of recurrence is highest in the first 12 months per se. Having said that, if she embarks on a pregnancy in the 13th or 14th month, it is okay. You do not really have to wait for 24 months, although that is the general consensus. It's important to know her estrogen status, her progesterone status, her HER2 status. It's important to ensure that she is disease-free, she has not had recurrence. If she's had exposure to alkylating agents, an echocardiogram is important. The management in the pregnancy is without any change. It is the same as any other mother. She can embark on a pregnancy safely. Postpartum breastfeeding is not contraindicated. The mother has breast cancer. The mother had chemotherapy. If you have an interval of beyond three weeks, she can breastfeed. Please do not forget VTE prophylaxis. Progesterone and estrogens are relatively contraindicated in mothers with breast cancer in pregnancy. So the contraception should ideally be non-hormonal. Please make a decision on when to reinitiate chemotherapy. And once you have reinitiated chemotherapy, it is recommended to stop breastfeeding. So summary about breast cancer in pregnancy. Breast cancer is not uncommon. It is more common as what we perceive. If a mother had chemo exposure, it is recommended to have a baseline echo. Every single breast lump, you should have a triple assessment. It is okay to have an ultrasound, mammogram, it is not usually recommended, but a core needle biopsy is recommended. Chemotherapy is okay in pregnancy. If you're unsure, seek a second opinion from an experienced team. I'm going to quickly move on to various other cancers. Management of ovarian cancer in pregnancy. Fortunately, most cysts are benign in pregnancy. The incidence of malignancy of ovarian cancer in pregnancy is low. It's only quoted between 2 to 10 per 100,000 pregnancies. Fortunately, mostly a stage one. So the old school opinion that you have to do a cystectomy in pregnancy for all cysts at 16 weeks of pregnancy is not true. Current thoughts are you only offer cystectomies if you think it has got malignancy features. But incidentally, you happen to find an ovarian cyst in pregnancy. If she's gone past the first trimester, the risk of cyst accidents is low. The recommendation is to manage her expectantly because most of them are benign. Most of them are stage one. The prognosis of ovarian cancer in pregnancy is unchanged. Please remember 30% of the time, it is an incidental finding. Tumor markers are not recommended, but inhibin, LDH, and AMH are unchanged in pregnancy. If you're not sure, you can do an MRI. MRI is not contraindicated in the pregnancy. Management is expectant if there are benign features. If it's malignancy, it is unilateral self-fingal eustrectomy. By performing a unilateral self-fingal eustrectomy, it does not change the prognosis or the outcomes in pregnancy. Please remember, if you were to operate minimal handling of the uterus, you can use tocolytic agents. 
if you were to do a cystectomy below 16 weeks, then the mother needs additional progesterones until the placenta takes over. And please remember, paclitaxel and carboplatin are safe in pregnancy. It is usually limited for those with high grade or beyond 1C ovarian cancer in pregnancy. Cervical cancers in pregnancy. For cervical cancers, such as most common gynecological cancers in pregnancy, after breast, the second most common cancer you might see is cervical cancers. The most common histological subtype are squamous cell carcinomas. Most are asymptomatic. Do you have to routinely perform a pap smear in pregnancy? It is not recommended, namely because it is not sensitive and so do not routinely do a pap smear in pregnancy. Fortunately, most of the cervical cancers, if they are pre-malignant, management will be expected. What in terms of expectant management? You can do a HPV karyotyping. If the HPV karyotyping yields a low risk, then you do not need any additional interventions in pregnancy. But if a HPV karyotyping is of high risk, and she's got a pre-invasive cervical disease. The management is colposcopy, surveillance, and biopsy only if you see a suspicious lesion. How about cervical cancers in pregnancy? The mother's got early stage, stage 1A. You can treat it locally via LEDs or a cone biopsy in pregnancy. The mother has got stage 1A2, 1B, in 1B1. These are the most difficult part of cervical cancers to manage. The recommendations is a cone biopsy followed by a laparoscopy to assess pelvic lymph adenopathy. So you can manage early stage 1, stage 1A, stage 1A2, stage 1B, and stage 1B1 in pregnancy. But if the mother has got a stage beyond 2, then you need to make a decision about continuing the pregnancy, terminating the pregnancy, or preterm deliveries. So the take-home message, stage two and above, pregnancy is controversial. Stage 1A, stage 1A2 can be managed easily in pregnancy. Stage 1B, 1B1 is challenging. Thyroid cancers in pregnancy. So up to 10% of thyroid cancers are managed in pregnancy and within one year post-delivery. It is common for a pregnant mother to have goiter. Once again, please do not just say this is physiological and send her back off. She needs to have an ultrasound assessment and you can do a fine needle aspiration. Fine needle aspiration is not recommended for breast cancers, but it is okay for thyroid cancers in pregnancy. Can you do a thyroidectomy in pregnancy? Yes, you can. Pregnancy should not be a contraindication for surgical intervention. But radioactive iodine are not recommended in pregnancy or breastfeeding. Hematological cancers in pregnancy. Well, the most common hematological cancers in pregnancy are Hodgkin's disease. Usually, they will present with painless supraclavicular or cervical lymph nodes. The diagnosis is not difficult, provided that you investigate every single presentation of lymph nodes in pregnancy. Basically, you can do an ultrasound and you need a fine needle aspiration. So biopsy of the lymph nodes is not contraindicated. Please do not say it is normal in pregnancy. And ABBD chemotherapy is safe, especially in the second trimester. How about other cancers in pregnancy? I'm going to briefly talk about a few other cancers in pregnancy, but please remember the principles of care is the same. Meningiomas are not uncommon in pregnancy. It increases in size, namely because mostly are estrogen or progesterone positive. The recommendation is a surgical resection. Over the last 12 months, we had about three mothers with meningiomas presenting in pregnancy, and all of them had meningioma resections. Melanomas are not uncommon, but you need to have a fetal and placental assessment to ensure there are no spreads. Colon cancers, treatment is surgical interventions. We also had mothers who present with spinal cord tumors, whom we also operated in pregnancies. So ladies and gentlemen, 
what is the summary of my talk today? <clears throat> Cancer in pregnancy and survivors are not as uncommon. Please remember, atypical or vague presentations do not hesitate to over-investigate. It is okay to over-investigate, but it is not okay to blame it on the pregnancy. Please remember your late facts that I mentioned earlier. It's important to have a specialized multidisciplinary team. If you have a maternal medicine specialist, then that is the person whom you should be referring to. Please remember, surgical intervention is safe. You can do a mastectomy, you can do a biopsy, you can do an excision. Pregnancy should not be an excuse not to treat mother. Termination is not always the option. Evidence is progressing. Chemotherapy is not contraindicated in pregnancy. There are more and more and more chemotherapies that are safe. Please include the partner. Please include the patient in the decision making. Please do not forget other issues such as VTE, sepsis, and prematurity. If you're really unsure, please pick the phone and refer to an expert. And this is the summary of my talk on cancer in pregnancy. So if you do have some questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I think we have got about two to three minutes to answer the questions. Does anyone have any questions? Either everyone has got postprandial hyperglycemia or you have been overwhelmed, but please feel free to ask questions. Oh, there's no question. No questions. Oh, there's a question. If a pregnant woman with cervical cancer advance 1B1 diagnosed at 20 weeks of pregnancy. So remember the chart that I showed earlier in pregnancy? 1B1 can be managed in pregnancy. So the first thing, she needs the LETS or she needs a cone biopsy. Secondly, a laparoscopy to assess pelvic limb nodes. And that is the management of cervical 1B1 in pregnancy. She does not need a termination of pregnancy. She can be treated in pregnancy. Is there any other questions? While we wait for questions, my take-home message for everyone, I only believe in two things. The greatest enemy of knowledge is actually ignorance. It is not ignorance, it's actually the illusion of knowledge. So sometimes we think we know, but actually what we know is just the tip of the iceberg. It is okay to refer. Munis, I think uh, Ali's had a question. In the name of pregnancy. Uh, Munis, I think Ali's had a question. Yep, when I just answered the question, so Alice did ask about 1B1 cervical cancer in pregnancy. Uh, do we do it immediately? Yes. Do we wait for fetal maturity? No. Remember what I said earlier? The time scale to manage a mother with cancer in pregnancy is unchanged as a mother who's not pregnant. So, the recommendation is to do a cone biopsy. Do not wait for fetal maturity. Do not wait for 24 weeks. Do not wait for 28 weeks. Is to do a LEDS or a cone biopsy as much as what your resources recommend, but as soon as possible. Okay, thank you so much, Munez. Um, I think at the moment, um, there are no further questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to, of, of your Saturday to come and give a talk to our trainees. We really appreciate it. And we, we would thank you with a round of applause, but obviously you can't hear them clapping in front of their computers. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for the kind invitation. See you all. Bye.